Welcome to this week's graphics programming virtual meetup. We follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord, which you can join. We have a Twitter, which you can follow. And we post the presentations, the recording of the presentations to our YouTube channel for later viewing. This week, we're going to be covering the ray trace shadows in Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Um, we'll be talking about mainly the ray tracing and acceleration structures in it. We'll mostly be looking at the slides of the presentation. Uh, so it'll be kind of a short week, kind of a high level overview rather than a deep dive or anything. This is, um, let me pull up the slide deck here and pull up to the top. This is Michael Oleknik, who's a Infinity Ward Poland guy. Let me paste here. Um, uh, who has background music? Antoine? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is their presentation. This was presented at Digital Shadows. Uh, dig Digital Drag... Oop, I didn't mean to click that. Digital Dragons. Stop. <laughs> nope, too far. Um, here's the link to the YouTube. This is the presentation. Um, and lastly... Why is this not, okay, copy video URL. This is a good DXR introduction by SIGGRAPH. It's from 2018. So if you wanna learn more about DXR and how to use it rather than a specific implementation, this would be a good place to start. Um, and I'll go back to my slides and basically do what I just did. So the summary of the things that I found interesting uh, was how they chose ray tracing to replace their local light shadow maps because of the way ray tracing works it works really well in that specific case um, they had to manage how they merge different blazes or bottom level acceleration structures because it was a tricky balance between merging everything and having very slow blast creation by very fast ray trace traversal but that the cost of slowing down regular performance because it would the more things you combined into one thing, the less instancing you could do. So if you had you know, five high fire hydrants and you combine them all into one thing, you couldn't instance that fire hydrant as, more, as easily. Um, the other was a recommendation to multi-thread your BLAS building and other performance recommendations. Shadows, they, is similar to the first point about working well for the local lights, but in detail, there are many slow parts of ray tracing or things that can cause the GPU to stall and have indirections and shadows work well, but alpha tested geometry where you, the geometry isn't perfectly opaque, but could have holes in it where the uh, alpha texture is, uh, you know, value zero. That is a problem and that there's, there isn't a good solution currently. Uh, the last thing I really understood before it went off the deep dive with <laughs> denoising was that a blaz or an acceleration structure does not have to match up with the physical geometry. And so you might get mismatches between the two and you need to, well, uh, solve that somehow so you don't have self-occluding geometry. Just a quick DXR overview for people who aren't familiar. DXR, direct X-ray tracing, is a new hardware pipeline that accelerates ray tracing in, in real time graphics. There's a couple of different new shader types, just like there's vertex and fragment shaders or pixel shaders and uh, direct X parlance. There's any hit, miss, closest hit, all sorts of other types. They tend to be small shaders. They don't tend to be very complex ones, um, but they're still programmable so you can do more complex things than triangle intersections, but you can do, so I think you can do stuff like, uh, you can do like sphere intersections if you want, but they're generally geared towards triangle inter, uh, triangle geometry. So that has built-in built -in shader support. Um, ray tracing is very expensive. If you do a, if you test a ray against every geometry object in your scene. So the way they optimize it is using an acceleration structure, which I didn't add what kind of acceleration structure it is, and it's a bounding volume hierarchy, or BVH, for it, what it is. Um, that's what the hardware accelerates. So that's what we're, um, there might be other acceleration structure types that work better or worse, but 
DXR uses BVHs, and they're split up into two kinds of uh, a, uh, ASs or top level and bottom level. Bottom level is encompassing the geometry and top level is encompassing the scene. Generally for every model or mesh you create one BLAS and your entire scene is one TLAS or TLAS, however you want to say it. And you rebuild the top one every frame so as the objects move around you regenerate the uh, highest level so that if the, the ray comes in it will know where the thing is but the bottom one is where you have a lot of mesh detail so you don't want to rebuild that every frame instead you want to build that once and then keep reusing it if you can and that separation helps with managing changing of the scene if you're doing a static scene you would just want one uh, entire acceleration structure because that now would be the fastest to traverse. But since we're having to amortize the build time and the traversal time because we have a fixed frame budget, you have to make trade offs. So that's linked to the direct X ray tracing. Uh, it's three hours. If it's a class, it's those, those classes are pretty good though. So um, do recommend if you want to dive into it, that'd be a good thing to set up and work through on a weekend. So now I'm going to actually just go to the presentation. And so it's, uh, I um, already said. Sorry, there's a question in the chat. Oh, uh, the directional light changes direction. Do the BLAS have to be rebuilt? No, a uh, bounding volume hierarchy is, the, you can think of it as not like an oct tree where you have a rigid fixed size. It's more like, I, I imagine it as more fluid where you could have a big box with a small box and then a slightly larger box on the inside, but still smaller than the big one. And as you subdivide it, it's subdividing the space such that whenever you put a ray through it, all of the um, sub objects of that bounding volume um, get checked. And so it, is hierarchical. So it's kind of like, you know, an oct tree will have, or a quad tree will have four children, but of uh, uh, whereas a quad tree divides up the space evenly, a bounding volume hierarchy is flexible so that it's the most um, space efficient relative to the geometry inside of it. So the ray is coming in at any angle and it hits the outside one. And then if it intersects with the outside, it's a outside AABB, I believe, uh, access and line bounding box, then it checks on the inside. And once it finally get down to the last level, that's when you have only a small number of triangles or shapes inside of it. So um, it's probably going overboard in the explanation, but hope that clears things. Um, this is just an introduction slide about what we're, what the presenters are gonna be presenting on. I will note that there was a lot of help from Powell, Klautsky, uh, I butchered the name probably, but it's a rendering engineer at NVIDIA, so it was collabor it, there was collaboration between the two to get everything working. Um, do note, performance timings are done on a RTX 2070, 1440p. So they wanted to choose something that worked well and they felt that visibility, visibility algorithms were going to fit well because they don't have to do shading. The fact is when you're doing ray tracing and you have to do shading, you have to do a whole bunch of material computations, texture lookups, and all sorts of fancy things. But if you're just doing uh, shadow casting or visibility as it's called here, then you don't have to do that. You can have one shader for all of it. Um, they felt they had th they felt they had three different places they could do it for ambient inclusion, sun shadows, or local lights. And they picked local lights for various reasons. Um, the interesting thing I found was that they had a area light uh, analytic shader, and I assume that. It, they didn't describe it here in detail, but I assume that means it's a, the area light shader, shading algorithm was not shadowing or doing any sort of uh, shadowing. And so if you had a 
shadow map for the area light because the area light's a box instead of a point, that shadow map could not accurately reflect that shadow or accurately describe that shadow because it's an area light. It's not a perfect cutout shape. It's a penumbra fuzzy thing. So that was a really good choice for making it a vast improvement over the analytic and accurate area lights, but the inaccurate shadow maps that go along with it. The constraints they had was that it was, it must work in their existing pipeline. They had already done a lot of development, so they couldn't do a whole bunch of experimentation and have to change and direct how future assets and pipelines will be built. They have to jerry rig on the end of it. Um, they use a forward plus light system. So there's a lot of shaders already. They don't want to add too many more. They have a hard cap on the number of lights in a scene at it or in a, in rendering a single frame. And they also wanted to, they had a requirement over performance obviously, but the more specific way they put it is having a fixed budget of rays so that they only spend so much time of, of the GPU doing rays or th spamming rays and they need to vary, vary how they spread those out between the different lights. So um, this is a great visualization of the differences. I'm, I'm hoping the compression isn't eating it too much, but you can see here the hard shadows on all the objects whereas here you have nice soft shadows where there's a light up above and the, um, well actually that, that looks smooth in both, but the hard shadows on the objects are very obvious. Um, so yeah. The soft shadow is baked for the above. And yeah. there are objects that you cannot bake them, so that's where it's yeah. hard. Yeah, they might be like destructible or something um, to, so that, that wall is probably a light map. I didn't notice that before, but it certainly makes the scene a lot more smooth. It's kind of like adding in ambient occlusion because that's kind of how ambient occlusion works. So they're getting it for free in a way, even though it's not, uh, rasterized ambient occlusion is a hack. R ray tracing ambient occlusion is just a consequence of the lighting. So it kind of makes sense, if not, makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, the uh, wall is definitely baked. Um, just because that's a fixed light point. Um, uh, surprisingly sharp. I think, I think shadow maps are usually very sharp rather than smooth, where uh, real-time shadow maps, it's actually hard to get the fuzzy edge, uh, from my understanding. So acceleration structures are how they make it fast. You got your top level and your bottom level. The bottom level contains geometry. The top level contains instances. So you have the same geometry multiple times in a TLAS. They had a hard time <laughs> managing that. What was it? Yeah, I'm playing fast and loose with this presentation. So uh, this is, I, I, I'm not super, what's, what's the word? Super detail oriented here. I'm just reading what I see or reading what I remember seeing and thinking about. So <laughs> they, they talk about having multiple BLASs overlap. That's because there are Uh, wait, was is this the problem with the um, building? Yeah, because they're, they're having to do it every frame, so they're having to be really fast and uh, rough with it. So they actually had issues with multiple BLASs being on top of each other, even though um, they shouldn't of, like uh, in a uh, perfect world, perfectly correct versus uh, fast, which is what the world that they lived in. Um, 
DXRIPEI allows you to have multiple index and vertex buffers um, when you're building um, BLASs, so you can actually combine multiple geometries into it. The th thing was their mesh pipeline, their, their, their mapping pipeline, which they call their uh, they, uh, <laughs> background, they had two types of geometry in the scene, models and brushes. Was it models? Yeah, models. A brush is huge. It's all the scene, it's all the background, the, uh, the, the floor, the walls, the ceiling of buildings. Whereas models were all the boxes, the players, the cars, and all the things that could move in it. And their asset conditioning pipeline, or whatever you want to call it, merged all of that brush or the scene geometry into one thing but that's a problem because a single light here only impacts the area around it yet it's being tested against this entire geometry object because that's what if it was more efficient in a rate in a raster pipeline and so this is an interesting a consequence of have introducing ray tracing into the pipeline that you, what is efficient in a rasterized context now may not be efficient for your uh, acceleration structure and ray traversal in the ray tracing pass. And so you may, we may need to rethink how we, well, how those tools uh, spit out optimized geometry. So we may be starting to optimize more for ray tracing instead of pure rasterization and that can affect things. Um, here is geometries per blas. Um, BLAS merging performance. So you can see the more geometries you have uh, per BLAS, you actually, there's a pretty significant uh, speed up. Though I'm not sure exactly what they're measuring with the ray trace here. Um, and you can't just, uh, I, I will say, you can watch the presentation and you can read the slides and they're almost identical. So anything that's not listed here, you're not likely gonna get much, you're not gonna get a much more detailed explanation from the thing. Uh, I heard another instance of this, textured billboard leaves are actually more expensive than high poly. Yeah, actually, they talk about that in a second. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Blas merging. Yes. Uh, there are separate TLASs per light, so they had a TLAS per light in the scene, which makes sense when you're having a, a limited viewing area in the, the TLAS and the things coming in and out of the TLAS, like objects, other things, so you can more accurately cull non-occluding objects. But when you have giant geometry like this, you can't really do that, so you'll have multiple objects uh, in the, the yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a lot of things that you can really drill down and understand what they're trying to do, and why they did. It. I found this talk to be very high level, very quick on the description. So you know, BLADS build scale badly for smaller poly count. Uh, this is where multi-threading comes in. <laughs> Oh boy, you need a higher level, top level acceleration structure, says Owen. Uh, you can always solve a problem in computer science with another layer of abstraction or indirection, whichever is more suited for the uh, subject matter. Um, this is describing just needing to parallelize building blazes. From my understanding, the DXAR API doesn't have the same deferred uh, the uh, acceleration structure building that the Vulcan ray tracing does. I know uh, DXR came out two years before that, so maybe it's been added since then, and maybe Vulcan does the same thing as DXR, and I just am unfamiliar with the differences. Um, but there is description of it's improving with newer driver and may not be an issue in the future with things that are coming in the pipeline. Or did it say that? And I was just reading into that. Uh, yeah, consider recording multiple command lists in parallel uh, when calling build ratio. Yeah, so parallelize it. Uh, can you build? Yeah, I, I didn't see a 
description that you could build the balazes on the GPU, which might be what I remember from Vulkan. I correct me if I'm wrong. Anyways, here's a chart describing all the different things for uh, for building balazes of different LODs and surfaces, and you can see the triangle count ninety three thousand, not just ninety three, and how much CPU time it took. The problem was it wasn't a linear quantity, or you can see this has 2,000 triangles since this is 93, but this has 65 or 0.65 milliseconds where this is only 36, which is not a, a linear relationship between the number of triangles. So you, you don't want a lot of small surfaces. You want a lot more high density meshes here. So now we can go into ray tracing for best performance, do these things, which with shadows, you can do easily. Don't want multiple shaders. The less shader swapping you can have, the better. You know, divergence, instruction cache, uh, misses, uh, any hit shaders, um, which are when the ray hits anything. Uh, recursion, so that'd be necessary for reflections and uh, diffuse global illumination stuff where you're having to bounce off a semi-specular surface, or semi-reflective, to figure out how much lighting from the rest of the scene is. You know. So to keep ray payload size, the way the shaders communicate to each other is instead of using the vertex attribute style with the you know, vertex attribute one, two, three, whether it's you know, VEC3, VEC3, VEC2, you basically have a struct and uh, you can pass it between things and it's the payload, as it's called and you want to keep it as low as possible. Well, it's a lot of work for shadows. Uh, Garcia uh, has says it's a lot of work for shadows. And this stuff is like, and stuff like this is why I'd prefer to go all in if I remember importing RT into an engine. Well, if you look at the screenshots later on, it's, they're very better. <laughs> they're, they're a lot better. So it's a lot of work but it may be worth it for the increased fidelity and decreased artifacts from shadow maps. <laughs> um, so yeah, accept hit and end search when possible. You, you, so do these things and shadows let you do those things or visibility stuff where it's just a binary hit or don't hit. Um, so you have, I believe these are the, there's five shaders they use and that's all they need. For what they do. They have to have one that's alpha testing and uh, another one for mismatch geometry, which is described later. So that's one way they can keep the verdant slow, which is always a bane of GPU programming. He wants few things going different directions at the same time as possible. Having fewer shaders, having fewer ways rays can go, the better. Um, the fact that all the rays are coming from one place means they're more coherent in that you're all just going this way. There's not secondary bounces that go every other direction. So you're, there's less, the, the rays in a chunk here are more likely to all go in the same direction, uh, reducing divergence. Yeah, ray cast from pixel light, there wouldn't be any recursion in there. And the, the distance that you have to go is as far as the geometry is from the light, which, you know, when the, the maps are close and small, it's not gonna be very far. Um, interestingly, just random thought, but all the pictures here are at night or are indoors. I believe that's just to show off the lighting because that's where it's most prevalent. Um, I wonder what it looks like in a outdoor scene with um, you know, tree, with a sun beaming down on everything if they use you know, cascade shadow maps for that and it works reasonably well. Um, and then if they have an indoor section in a daylight scene, then they're, they'll have the local lights there to keep everything illuminated. Oh, I'm skipping past where I was. Um, directional lights are purely shadow maps in uh, Modern Warfare. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, this is in the, with DXR, you can use ray tracing instead of shadow maps for directional lights. Wait. Directional light, sun, that's like the sun, never mind. Mm. Cold War, the next game in the franchise, 
uh, where or one of the later games is the one where they introduced ray tracing directional lights. So that'd be like the sunlight, I assume, is what's going on. I'm not super familiar with the game. Uh, Owen says there's a video that shows off where the cascading shadow maps and Warzone, and it's kind of interesting. Yeah, cascading shadow maps are cool for their uh, t their uh, you know they take the camera into account for shadows from a far distance away, uh, which I find interesting so that you get large scale seeing wide shadows without um, giant, giant shadow buffers or you know, shadow textures. So um, ray tracing in practice, they have their, in their payload, payload, they have a bit for visibility um, and they also have to keep the velocity for denoising and this is where they start losing me with the, uh, the when they start talking about denoising. Uh, there's a link to the Modern Warfare Warzone stuff, so we'll have to get that into the uh, link repository later. So it uses only one bit for visibility, which I found interesting, you know, because it's like, oh, we have soft shadows, but uh, mm, I wasn't sure. <laughs> uh, because, all oh right, because they use denoising, it helps smooth out the, uh, oh yeah, yeah, so they can get away with a single bit for visibility. Um, they use 10 uh, instance ID, yeah. So if the shadow caster is moving around, it's useful information to have when denoising. Yes, from what I understand, the velocity is necessary because then they can know to reject velocities that are too high. So they can't, they can selectively ignore parts of the screen that wouldn't make sense to, uh, or that would cause artifacts, you know, blurs and smears and other junk. Um, so there's an instance ID that they can store data into, and that's helpful for reducing bandwidth. Alpha testing. They only have a single slide. Ah, that's pretty dense. The conclusion is that there's research that is promising that might answer the problem with alpha testing, but the best way to do alpha testing now in the sense of accuracy is to subdivide the geometry into opaque and into smaller geometry that reflects the textures um, detail instead of having a big triangle that the texture defines where there are holes and not, you just turn that into real geometry. Uh, but that's not actually faster and doing that can, can add so much more mesh detail, you know, turning a single quad or a single triangle into many thousands is not efficient. And so for things like foliage, it's, it's really hard to do the right thing because it's, um, any hit rays? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, alpha testing requires dependent memory fetches, which is why it's slow. You have to fetch the texture and then you can check if you need to um, go through it or uh, jump, jump out because you hit geometry and can end this traversal. Um, so. Is there any ways, is there more, is this more so they don't have to use any hit shaders, any hit rays? Um, yeah, I think that's, that was the, yeah. The alpha testing was, um, requires to using any hit. And if they didn't have to, that'd be really, really nice. <laughs> so, Yeah, they don't really have an answer here. They just say it's a problem and I hope we have a better solution in the future. Um, um, yeah, I don't think they, they offer what they do other than it's slow and we wish it was faster. So, you know, 1.5 milliseconds to four and a half. So that's three times slower to uh, support alpha testing here. Um, the next problem was mismatching geometry. Uh, is an alpha test, uh, alpha is something we have to eat in general? 
in restoration alpha is a problem. Yes, alpha textures are a problem in both rasterization and ray tracing. Yeah. Um, because you're, you're effectively turning what is a solid plane into a partially solid plane in a alpha tested geometry. Um, and that's not even considering transparent objects. That's just like a hard cutoff edge. So alpha's hard. Uh, mismatch geometry. So what's happening here is the mismatch between a triangle that the rasterizer produces and where the BLAS thinks the triangle is or wants the triangle to be. And so you get well, self occlusion where their area that would have been shaded if it was pixel or perfect um, is now being occluded when it shouldn't have been. As you can see in the little diagram here, this area, um, the triangle is overlapping where the BLAS says it is so it doesn't get doesn't get the actual value it should. Um, um, this is a thing that happens when you have stuff like animation and tessellation and subdivision because uh, your geometry that you feed into the BLAS might actually be much lower quality than the actual mesh you create for things like tessellation, you know, creating small rock details on the the floor of a cave or uh, you know uh, animation also does that <laughs> so they have a ray bias oh, they have a ray bias is how they solved it so they thought about using stencil bits but there wasn't enough to go around and needed enough for other things so they have a ray bias in an any hit shader um, and we can, they, they can set a bias per object, which I believe, you know, if ray T current less than bias, ignore hit. So that can, it fix the issue. The, uh, should have showed the picture first, but this is the visualization of what it is, where this ground is, you know, it's muddy rocks and dirt and it's tessellated to have nice detail. Um, but because of that, the BLAS is not reflecting that shape, and so it self-intersects and causes a black areas here and here. And by introducing the bias, and it knows, to, oh, I have a certain amount of actual distance that's not there, and applies it and fixes it. Uh, JB, like they know if the surface would be displaced more than a certain amount. Yeah, that's I, that's what the bias is set for. So. So uh, there's lots, lots of fun things. So denoising, I've mentioned it three times already, but denoising is where things get wacky because it's not something I really understand. And they do lots of things. Uh, because they're using Ford Plus, they have lots of shaders. Uh, that means they can't afford to have a whole bunch of extra shaders that then get multiplied with the Ford Plus shaders. This is what I did understand from the presentation. So they had to make sure to keep everything really cheap and um, easy. Um, yeah, Blender internal actually has a similar ray bias feature because you can decouple the rasterizes to rasterize geometry from the RT geometry if desired. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so this is a demonstration of the exponential shadow maps. There's light leaking on the bottom of the object when there shouldn't be, but with ray tracing, it does that, it's a point light, nice hard shadow, but it point lights don't actually exist. We have things like spheres and, what is this? What is that? Oh, is that? Sorry. Uh, I don't know what that is and I just clicked a yellow box and it, it's gonna have to reload the entire presentation. Thanks. Um, <laughs> this is the sphere light, which is physically correct. Uh, oh, a quick thing. Um, that was mentioned way, way up above. They separate the ray, the visibility check from the shading, which is not physically accurate, but it looks similar enough they can get away with it. And that's how they're able to do this ray tracing with visibility only and not, sh uh, and not doing the shading where this is basically just checking how light or dark 
the surface should be rather than things. Um, I believe the exponential shadow map is really just to show it's where shadow maps can break down. Um, with a sphere light, we get the nice big noisy thing. With TAA, we can resolve it. And from a distance, this looks decent. It's still a little fuzzy if you're, excuse me, if you're able to see it. But if you zoom in, you can definitely see the pixelation. Um, when you start getting the denoiser, temporal denoiser, denoiser really cleans it up. And then if you blur this, if you do, do a spatial blur, they, uh, it fixes it up even more such that it looks like it's intended to be that way. So that's the four steps. Um, they load balance the, uh, yeah, the, the four passes they do. They first figure out which lights to do. They load balance however many rays they want, figure out which light gets however many rays. They do the ray tracing, they do temp nor temporal denoiser, and then they do a spatial and back upsample it. Because it's actually done at half resolution on the single axis or looking at it at a 2D plane, it's, it's a quarter the number of total pixels that they then upscale to the full screen. So they're, you know, a 1080p output buffer. They'd only be ray tracing on a, uh, 540p. Yes, that sounds right. Um, I can do math in my head. So this is where they do the, then they describe their noise, their load balancing. So up they, oh, that's no, that's not that load balancing. Um, four lights per pixel. They, they can store four separate channels for light visibility. And then they have a fallback for not denoised lights that are an extra three, so that can help when there's the you know, very distant lights. Um, yeah, talks about the data they need for everything. You know, uh, visibility moments, light indices, temporal history, length. Max shadow caster velocity, normal depth, lots of data they need to pass around. Is it? I need to. Okay. Um, yeah, outputs to GRG32, read by ray trace pass. Wait, oh, the indices, sorry. So that's the light indices in which they are going to use, uh, you know, eight, figure out which lights need to be cast for that pixel. Um, you know, the one you know, <laughs> they have a strict 255 or 56 light limit, so they have to call lights based off what's visible and what's closest. And you can see here, there's a visualization of all the lights that are present and how they're affecting the scene. So tile cold lights, spot shadow fall off. So uh, yeah, how many lights are in the hallway versus where they're actually affecting things. I don't know if it's very hard. If it if this image blower image is blurred because of the compression, then it'd be hard to tell. But there's little slivers of pink and green and yellow where the multiple lights overlap. Um, so here's the load balancing, and so one full screen light, four rays per light per pixel, because there's one light. But if you have four full screen lights, then you have one ray per light per pixel. But if you have like one half screen light, then they can double the amount of rays per light. So um, the, the light, the levels have more than 256 lights, but the renderer can only use 256 of them at a time for each individual frame. And that's mainly just because the levels are going to be streamed in and out. Parts of it will be streamed in and out. Um, they describe how they're, and when they're talking about the BLAS, is they actually have a bit about the, the streaming system manages keeping two overlapping BLASs out because they're different in different streaming chunks. So as you're walking through a level, you'll have many thousands of lights, but only a couple hundred are active at any time. Um, so I'm just going to skim through the next slides because these are ones I didn't fully, fully get. Um, temporal denoising. Uh, if someone has something to say about them, cool. I'm, I'm not familiar with 
much of these techniques. So other at, at anything other than a cursory uh, understanding, not enough to um, do anything about. So you can see their, their thing here, this would be if you did it at full res and this would be at half res and using a bilinear and a jit jitter, it, it approaches the quality of a full res, which is interesting. So, yeah. There are open problems to solve, alpha testing geometry, all alpha testing, mismatch geometry, denoising, and, uh, you know, lots, lots, of, lots of cool things. The pictures side by side, these are, you can s visually see how much smoother this shadow is than the area light in the above image because it's a fluorescent, you know, long bulb. Um, here's the same thing we saw earlier. Here's a hallway. I really like the grate pattern because that looks cool, but that's not realistic at all. It looks correct if your shadow is right here. Like you can see that they're sharp here, but very fuzzy in the, on the wall over here because that's how a sphere, you know, area light would affect a grid, grid pattern like that. Um, yeah, so this is a semi-outdoor scene, but still at night. You can see how much the smoothing around the boxes here and the lamppost. Um, I guess it just feels more natural to me. Uh, Toshi says, denoising is conceptually just a weighted average of samples or a smart blur. Yeah, I get that. That's that's my cursory understanding. It's actually applying it, understanding how the math fixes, okay, well, this frame was here, that frame was there, we'll use those pixels and make sure everything works. And then some of those concepts just, um, I have no credibility in which to talk about them. <laughs> Draw the rest of the hell, yes. Um, I can say these pictures look nicer. Um, this one already looks really nice, but um, that's probably because the shadows are a bit more muted um, than in other scenes. So, yeah. So I do want to thank the people who actually made the presentation. I don't want to be called copycatting or stealing their work. It's not mine. Um, they did some cool stuff. I wanted to share it with others. And I wanted an excuse to, sh uh, to read it because it was in my backlog of things to read. And presenting is a really good way for me to actually look at it. So, do you have any other questions before we end the recording?